Today we have a presentation yet again from the topic electrochemistry. We want to look at uh, 2001 paper 2 chemistry question that tested on this topic. Now, before we do that, I want to also take this opportunity to revise on two areas which usually give students a lot of hard time. The first area which I want to revise on is preferential discharge. Preferential discharge of ions. So we have the first area, preferential discharge of ions, and I also want to talk about the uses, uses of standard electrode or reduction potentials. So these two areas are giving our students very hard time and what is actually like a sure bet is that this topic of electrochemistry will have to be in either paper one or paper two. So understanding of these two areas will really come in handy to any student preparing for KCSE chemistry. So we are starting with preferential discharge. Now, students should know that preferential discharge of ions take place in non-binary electrolytes. These are those electrolytes that have more than two ions in solution. Now, these ones are normally obtained from solutions of salts. The opposite of non-binary electrolytes are the binary electrolytes. These ones were dealt with at form two level and normally they only have two types of ions, so knowing which one would be discharged is very easy because anode will only attract one ion and cathode will also attract only one that will finally be discharged. So binary electrolytes are always obtained from melts of salts. A good example is the lead bromide that uh, was discussed in form two. So when you are carrying out uh, electrolysis on molten lead bromide, it is so easy to know which salt would get discharged at cathode and which one will get discharged at anode. Why? Because in this liquid, we only have two ions. The first one is lead and the next one is bromide. So this one will move to cathode where it will finally be discharged and this one will go to the anode. So when you're dealing with binary electrolytes, there is no difficulty. So for this, that matter, at cathode, we shall have lead ions which are in aqueous state, accepting two electrons to give you lead metal. So the observation for this would be gray, gray deposits, or gray solid, or gray beads, whichever term you'd want to use. And then at anode, bromide ions, of course two of, two of them, are going to lose electrons to form bromine gas. And this one now will come out as brown fumes. So when it when we talk about binary electrolytes, the one that gets discharged is very, very easy to know because our electrolyte contains only two ions, one being a cation and the other one being the anion. The cation migrates to the cathode, 
the anion migrates to the anode. But when it comes to form 4, this kind of electrolytes were dealt with in electrochemistry 1, or rather effects of electric current on substances, a topic in form 2. When we come to form 4, things are now a bit different. We now have what we call non-binary electrolytes non-binary electrolytes. So these ones, as we have said, they are normally solutions of salts. So for instance, if I take magnesium sulfate and I put it into a solution, this one will have four ions in total. We will have magnesium ions, we will have sulfate ions, in that solution, but because we are using water to make this one aqueous, we have always said that water will also ionize partially to give you hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. So, uh, this equilibrium is highly tilted towards the left. So the concentration of the two ions are usually very low, but all the same they are there. So a form 4 is now faced with a dilemma between hydrogen and magnesium. Which one will I discharge at cathode? And then again, between hydroxyl or hydroxide and sulfate, which one will I discharge at anode? So this is the kind of confusion that reigns at Form 4. I am here today to make it very, very easy. So, to know which ion will be discharged, we always tell you that we do consider three factors. And one of them is position, position of ion in the electrochemical series. Now, our notes, our textbooks have got a very long list that they call electrochemical series. The question that learners usually ask, am I supposed to remember this order? I want to tell you no. The only thing you need to remember is that at anode, at anode we always discharge hydroxyl ions no matter the electrolyte you have. So candidates, students of chemistry, at anode of any non-binary electrolyte, we shall discharge hydroxyl ions. Now, when you discharge hydroxyl ions, or hydroxide ions for that matter, what do you obtain? We normally obtain water and oxygen gas. And then you balance the hydrogens and the oxygens that will force us to put a 4 here, a 2 on water. And then, because we have 4 hydroxyl ions, this reaction will be accompanied by 4 electrons. So please, get to know that. You do not have to remember the whole series. Coming to cathode, very easy as well. I want candidates to know that at cathode we always discharge hydroxyl ions. But there are exceptions. If your solution has copper, then it will not be hydrogen but copper. If your solution has mercury, it will now be mercury and not hydrogen. And finally, if your solution has silver, then you go for the silver and not hydrogen. So let me repeat. For the anode, it is always hydroxide ions. And when you discharge that, you get water and oxygen. For cathode, it is always hydrogen ions. But if you have these three ions, then you will go for them and not hydrogen. Students, I want to believe now that that point is clear. 
as far as the position of ion in the electrochemical series is concerned. Very, very simple. I don't see a reason why people should have any issue on this topic. And by the way, this is one of the topics I really, really enjoy in chemistry because it is straightforward, just like the mole. Ah, yeah. Let's move to the next factor that we consider, and this one is what we call concentration. We also consider concentration of ion in the electrolyte. So here, allow me to compare allow me to compare two similar solutions. I want to use dilute sodium chloride solution and this other side I want to use concentrated sodium chloride solution, what we always call brine. So, let's look at the ions that are present here. Sodium ions are there, chloride ions are there, and we have also said hydroxyl ions will not miss, and also hydrogen. Now, going by our factor one, we have just said that hydroxyl will be the one to be discharged at anode. So we go for hydroxyl, the normal way. So in this case, we use factor one to determine which ion will be discharged. And we have agreed it is what? It is hydroxide. For the cathode, it remains hydrogen. There we are. But let's have a look at what happens when now we have brine. Here now, we look at the ions that are present, and of course, sodium is highly concentrated, chloride, highly concentrated, hydroxyl, the concentration is low, and hydrogen ions, the concentration is also low. So what we say here is concentration. Candidates take note of this. Concentration as factor number two affects discharge, affects discharge only at a node. Take note of that. So for our case, for the anode, instead of hydroxyl, because their concentration is lower, now we shall discharge chloride. So what you need to remember as far as factor two is concerned is it only affects discharge at anode. So for this for that case, we shall now have chloride ions being discharged, and you will get chlorine gas and two electrons. So allow me to repeat, concentration as a factor only affects discharge at anode. Let's proceed to cathode. In this case, we will still have our hydrogen. The normal, this a similar case with when you use dilute sodium chloride. Students, I also want to again say that as far as concentration is concerned, I have made it quite simple. The only thing you need to remember is concentration as a factor affects preferential discharge only at anode. Finally, let's have a look at the third factor. The third factor is what we call nature of electrode nature of electrode and the, we have what we call inert electrodes inert electrodes will not affect discharge and as a student of chemistry you should know what they are made of so allow me to write them we normally use graphite and we can also use platinum now for us to understand this factor, I want to introduce electrolysis of copper 2 sulfate solution. So, a candidate should know that in the cell diagram, this one here, the long thin line represents positive terminal, and the short thick line represents the negative terminal. Now, these are the electrodes. The one connected to the negative terminal is called cathode. 
and the one connected to the positive terminal is called anode. So for now, I want us to use an inert electrode. Suppose I used graphite to carry out electrolysis in this diagram of mine. The first thing I need to know is, uh, in my electrolyte, I have copper ions, I have sulfate ions, I have hydrogen ions, and I also have hydroxyl ions. So if I use electrodes that are not, that are inert, sorry, and uh, an example is graphite, I will now look for my first factor. And this is position of ion in the electrochemical series. The inert electrode is not going to interfere with the electrolysis. So we've agreed for the anode, what shall we have? Hydroxyl, as usual. And when you, electro, when you uh, discharge uh, hydroxyl ions, as usual, we have said you will produce water, you will produce oxygen, and this will be accompanied by four electrons. Let's move to cathode. Cathode, we have copper and hydrogen. And if you can remember what we have just agreed, cathode is always hydrogen, but when you have copper, silver, or mercury, then you go for those other three. So for our case, instead of hydrogen, we shall now have copper being discharged. Quite easy, quite easy, quite easy. Now, suppose I remove these two electrodes that are made of graphite, and instead I use copper as my electrode. This copper electrode is now not inert. It will interfere with my discharge. So, if you are electrolyzing copper to sulfate using copper electrodes at the anode, there will be a totally different scenario. The anode will actually dissolve. The anode will go into solution. Why? Because the anode itself, which is made of copper, is going to be oxidized to copper ions. So these ones go into solution, and therefore your anode is going to become thin and thin and thin. What about cathode? Cathode will grow big. It will... Uh, have deposits. Why does it have deposits? Because the copper ions in solution are going to be turned into copper metal. So, just changing the electrode, you've been able to see a big change on how the electrolysis of copper two sulfate is able to take place. So, that is how the Three factors of preferential discharge are treated. Now into uses of standard electrode potentials. We had promised to revise on this as well before we take a past paper question. And this is the year 2001 chemistry paper 2. So these uses are also three. The first use is to compare reducing reducing and oxidizing to compare reducing and oxidizing uh, powers of elements. That is the first use of the values that we normally call E naught. So if I give you values, some are going to be positive, some are going to be negative, and that of hydrogen is going to be zero. We can use those values to know which elements are more oxidizing and which elements are more uh, reducing. Now, for this, my dear learners, I want to introduce to you a very simple tagline that is going to help us here in making very crucial decisions. The tagline goes like this. The element with the most positive the most positive 
E not value. So take note, most positive E not value. This one will be the strongest oxidizing agent. So I believe you can be able to remember this quite easily. The most positive E not value is the strongest oxidizing agent. Now, what happens to an oxidizing agent? An oxidizing agent is usually reduced. Oxidizing agent is reduced in reactions. Now, where does ox the reduction solely take place? It is, is it anode or cathode? Reduction takes place at cathode. So it means your element with the most positive E0 value will form the cathode. And finally, for those questions that ask you to draw the electrochemical cell, there are those cells that must be put on the left hand side and there are those cells that must be put on the left, on the right side. The elements, uh, the half cells that we normally put on the left hand side are those that undergo oxidation. And those that are put on the right are those that undergo reduction. For this case, our most positive element we have said will be the cathode. So where will we put it? We are going to put it on our right hand side because that is where reduction takes place. Now, candidates, if you remember our tagline, I tell you this part of electrochemistry is just so easy. So please, that's the tagline, and of course you can do the opposite, and you say the element with the most negative E0 value is now the strongest reducing agent. A reducing agent gets oxidized and oxidation takes place at anode and therefore we shall put it on the left hand side as we draw the complete cell diagram. Very, very easy. Now, to the next use and that is calculating the electromotive, electromotive force of cells. Here, as long as you know our tagline, we normally use the formula the, the EMF of cell is given by the E0 of the reduced species minus E0 of the oxidized species. So this one, the moment you remember your tagline, you will know which one will be reduced and you will know which one will be oxidized. So it becomes very, very cheap. I want to tell you that this can also be written as E reduction takes place at what? At cathode minus E, oxidation takes place at anode. Or, we can also have it as E, right hand side, because that's where the cathode is normally placed, minus E, left hand side, because that is where the anode is usually placed. Good enough. Let's proceed to the last use of standard electrode potentials. This is use number three. And we say we can also use these values to predict whether a reaction will proceed or not. So for this part it is easy. If you find that your E cell calculated up here is positive, that reaction will proceed. But if you calculate and find E cell is negative, that reaction will not proceed. With that, I now want to welcome you to the year 2001, Chemistry Paper 2, question number 3. And we try out another very exciting electrochemical question. So, welcome to the year 2001, Chemistry Paper 2, and you can see our question is number 3. So, we were being asked in part A, Study the standard electrode potentials, which we also call standard reduction potentials, for the half cells given below, and answer the questions that follow. The letters do not represent the actual symbols of the elements. So our interest 
is in these values and you can see some are negative some are positive and we also have a zero here which is hydrogen so questions and as we do these questions please don't forget what we have learned especially our tagline so identify the strongest oxidizing agent if you know the tagline quite easy what are we said the one with the most positive e naught value for our case it is element g and please when you are writing here it is urgent the element so don't give us a formula for the ion if you wrote the ion you are wrong the reason is it has the highest positive electrode potential quite easy or somebody can also say it has the strongest tendency to lose electrons this one can also be accepted so these questions become so easy my dear students if you have undergone what i've just revised with you that is on uses of standard electrode potentials and the preferential discharge let's proceed which two half cells would produce the highest potential difference combined so if you ask the highest you go for the most positive and the most negative let me repeat highest potential most positive and most negative some questions also ask the smallest or the least potential for that case now you go for the least positive versus the least negative but for our case we were asked the highest so i pick the most positive which we have agreed is g and then i'll go for now the least negative which in this case is n remember negative numbers negative 2.92 is greater than negative 0.44 so you go for highest positive and the highest negative there we are our answer then this one is asking explain whether the reaction represented below can take place we have just talked about the last use of standard electrode potential we are able to predict whether a reaction will proceed or not so looking at our equation moving from n ion to n element this one the oxidation number has changed from 1 to 0 for that matter this is reduction what about m m has moved from oxidation number 0 to oxidation number positive 2 this is increase in oxidation number and for that matter is it, it the, the process is oxidation so to tell whether this reaction will proceed or not i've just advised that you go ahead and calculate e cell which in this case is e reduced minus e oxidized now the reduced one is n check n n is negative 2.92 according to our table from here we are supposed to subtract m which has been oxidized and m is uh, 0.44 if you do this math i believe you are going to get negative 2.48 volts now the e value is negative so what have we said if it is negative the reaction will not proceed so you continue here and tell the examiner that the e cell is negative and for that matter hence the reaction the reaction represented above will not take place will not take place very very simple if you know what you are doing dear students so let's proceed and here we have a diagram for electrolysis of sulfuric acid so even before you go into your questions 
It is good we know the ions that are present here, and as we have agreed, sulfuric, uh, sulfuric acid has that formula. So we shall have hydrogen ions, sulfate ions in solution, and don't forget hydroxyl from water, though we don't have to repeat this, which is also uh, being supplied by water. So this one we agreed is uh, the positive terminal, that's the negative. So here is anode and here is cathode. As per our explanation, cathode, hydrogen, anode, hydroxyl. So with this information, now you can go ahead and answer your questions. Write an equation for the reaction that produces gas L. Gas L is being produced at the anode. So at anode, we are going to discharge hydroxyl ions. So we've agreed hydroxyl ions gives you water. When you balance, the process is accompanied by four electrons. So there you have it. Then uh, I've been using this term discharge. What do you mean by discharge? Discharge simply means that ions are being converted into elements. That process where ions are converted into elements through either gain of electrons or loss elect of electrons. It's what we call ion discharge. Now you know. Identify or rather describe how gas K can be identified. Gas K is hydrogen gas because we are discharging hydrogen ions at cathode. So questions on description must have a practical approach. For that matter, you just don't say it uh, burns with a pop sound. No, you have to describe it as an experimental setup. So the correct answer would have been insert a burning splint into a jar full of gas K. Then you end by saying that it burns it burns with a pop sound. Of course, for this one, we will assume that uh, our gas is mixed with some air because in pure form it doesn't produce uh, that, uh, that uh, pop sound. Then the next question, we are being asked, explain the difference in volumes of the gases produced. If you look at our diagram, we seem to be producing more hydrogen than oxygen. It lies in the equation. So let us see when you discharge hydroxyl ions. We produce water, we produce oxygen, and four electrons. So here, how many moles do we have? One mole. Let's proceed to discharge of hydrogen ions. Uh, this is what should happen if you are asked to write the equation. But normally, what happens, this number of electrons that have been lost at anode should be the same number accepted at cathode. So ordinarily, this is what should be the equation for the reaction at cathode. Because we insist on simplest ratio. But I want to state here that for a student to answer the question on volumes, you need to use the number of electrons lost here to be used here. So for that matter, we shall have to rewrite our equation like this so that we utilize the number of electrons that were lost at, at anode. So you can see now we are producing two moles of hydrogen for every mole of oxygen. And that is what brings about the differences in volume. But please, I repeat, if you're asked to write the equation, we insist on simplest ratio. If you wrote this, you are going to be wrong because 442 is not the simplest ratio. We are only using this to answer our question about volumes. So let us go back to the question. We are asked to explain the differences in volume. The answer is very simple. You tell us that for every, for every one mole 
of oxygen produced at which which electrode we produce oxygen at anode so for every one mole of oxygen produced at anode two moles two moles of hydrogen are produced at cathode so that is what makes the difference if you wrote the equations here well and good lastly we were asked the brightness explain the difference in brightness of the bulb if the same volume of two molar ethanoic acid was used in place of sulfuric so this one is more or less testing on strength of acids and we know ethanoic acid is a weaker acid so the answer here is that the bulb would be the bulb would be dimmer the bulb will be dimmer why because ethanoic acid ethanoic acid is a weaker acid ethanoic acid is a weaker acid hence its degree degree of ionization degree of ionization is lower than that of sulfuric acid again you can see the question is more or less comparative we are comparing sulfuric acid to ethanoic acid so dear students that is how 2001 paper 2 chemistry looked like i believe you enjoyed it if you understood the very very nice topic of electrochemistry in form 4 i like the topic i enjoy teaching it i want to thank you for your continued support continue watching continue subscribing continue spreading the message to your colleagues so that we all excel together all the best in your forthcoming exams once again thank you